In this video, we'll demonstrate how to respond to a Jehovah Witness who says that John 1-1-C should not be the word was God, but a God. Reminder to hit the subscribe button below and turn on the notification bell to stay up to date as new videos come out. And if you're interested in supporting this ministry, just go to JustScripture.org and click on the support page. In part one of this mini-series, we lay the foundation to the debate over the third clause in John's opening verse in his gospel. These three clauses stand in total opposition to any Unitarian, modalist, or cult that tries to strip Jesus down to anything less than God Almighty. So, they translate the third clause as a God, and then try to proceed to give us a lesson in Greek and about how there's a Sahidic Coptic manuscript out there that uses the indefinite article. With that, our goal is to throw at them seven different kinds of smoke. The first is by simply asking them, so you know Greek? Because we know that they're not teaching Greek at the Kingdom Halls, so when they give us this little lesson, just assume that they've never or really do know anything about Greek, could read Greek, or could translate Greek on the fly. They're just repeating what they've been told to say. The second is that the Septuagint Greek translation of Psalm 33 identifies the Logos as Yahweh the Creator. And you can easily see how John was drawn upon this psalm, but also by extension would take the reader back to Genesis 1.1 and by implication connect slash equate the Logos with God. And because of this equivocation, we then solidified our position by seeing that in Jeremiah's call that the word of the Lord, or Logos of God, was also noted as the Creator and addressed as Yahweh Elohim by Jeremiah himself. But the real cherry on top of all this was verse 9 that said that then Yahweh put forth his hand and touched my mouth, which demonstrates that Yahweh came in embodied form and could easily and physically did interact with his creation, which was no different than when Jehovah ate bread with Abraham, at Abraham's tent prior to Sodom's destruction, and also when he wrestled against Jacob all night long and then renamed him Israel. But just in case you think I'm stapling this all down with only Psalm 33 and Jeremiah 1, is that I will unload the gun on this so hopefully a giant epiphany goes off in some of your minds about how to connect the Old Testament and New, Testi New Testament together on this. At the beginning of Jeremiah, we see that the Logos came to Jeremiah in the days of Josiah and specifies the first time was in his 13th year in 527 BC, but also said that Yahweh came in the days of Jehoiakim and unto the 11th year of Zedekiah, which is 587 BC. That's a 40 year span that Jeremiah recounts that the word of the Lord came to him, and that's exactly what you do read in the book. Down at verse 13, it says that the Logos came a second time, and again equated the word with Yahweh. Flip the page, and you'll see the word again comes to him in chapter two. When you get to chapter 13, you see the word is additionally called the Lord God of Israel. Then in both 14 and 16, they say the word came again with 16.9 calling the Logos Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel. Now 18.1. The Logos which came to Jeremiah from Yahweh saying. Now we're going to stop there because this verse shows distinction between the Logos, who is Yahweh, from Yahweh. This should be ringing your bell back to Genesis 19.24 where we first saw two Yahwehs being present in the scene, yet distinct from one another in locality as the visible one was on the ground with Abraham, while the other was in heaven. 
Now I could inundate you with the other 20 times that this occurs in Jeremiah. And that alone would probably make you quote Frank Barone. But this is just the tip of the iceberg on this whole thing. Because Jeremiah is not the only prophet who is said to have a direct encounterance with the embodied Yahweh. Ezekiel said that he had 50 separate occurrences of the word of the Lord coming to him. And if you study Ezekiel, the fact that it is listed 50 times is no mere coincidence. But if your attention went immediately to the first one in 1-3 for a specific reason, well, don't worry about it. We'll be coming back to that one. Isaiah said the word came to him and announced that there will be a 10 degree shift back in with the sun as a sign to Ezekiah. And if we were to do a phrase search of this in the Old Testament, is that you will see that he shows up over a hundred times where 99% of those are with the prophets. But for our purpose here, with specifically John 1.1 1, 1 in mind, we are going to drill down on Samuel's first experience, then touch on Jonah's interaction, and then finally finish with Ezekiel's vision in chapter 1, 1 Samuel 3.1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious, or rare, in those days. There was no open vision. The key line here is that there was no open vision because he was referring to the word of the Lord who is said to have appeared very little during the time of the judges. This sets up the scene as Samuel is just a child, just kind of like Jeremiah was, when both of them are said to have been called to be a prophet. Verse 4, that the Lord called Samuel, and he answered him, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here I am, for thou callest me. And Eli said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for thou didst call me. And Eli answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. So you can see the sense and build up here from verse 1 saying that there was no open vision in those days. Verse 8, And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now here comes the key verse for us. And Yahweh came and stood and called as the other times and said, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Isn't this just fun? And again, Samuel said that he saw Yahweh right in front of him. And you wouldn't know if someone was standing there unless you actually saw someone. And by connecting this with Jeremiah's call, is that we are dealing another death blow to anyone who claims that Yahweh never did, or really cannot in their worldview, come in visible embodied form. And if you were to skim down to verse 13, is that you would see the embodied Yahweh telling Samuel that he is going to judge Eli's house, which is no different than Abraham calling the visible Yahweh the judge of all the earth, prior to Sodom's destruction. Verse 19, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And to add insult to injury to any Unitarian out there listening to this, verse 21 says, 
And Yahweh appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Now I bet for many of you out there that this is really starting to reorient your thinking as to what was taking place here. Because it's not the megaphone alert from heaven that you've always been accustomed to thinking that it was when the prophets announced something from the Lord. You have God appearing all over the Old Testament unto them. And so in light of this, now take a look at Jonah 1, 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Doesn't this sound a lot like what Yahweh told Abraham about Sodom's wickedness being great? Verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah literally meant this. He wasn't speaking metaphorically about running away from God. God appeared to him, told him what to do. Jonah didn't like it, so he ran away. But I can guess that you're probably thinking, yeah, but how could Jonah possibly really think that he was going to run away from God? Well, if you know anything about the concept of cosmic geography, then you'll understand what is probably going through his head at this point. But that's a topic for another day. So our final landing spot here today is in Ezekiel 1. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives, captives by the river Chabar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Notice the plurality of visions that are said to have taken place to Ezekiel. This is in reference to the 50 instances of the word coming to Ezekiel with two other occurrences where he said that he saw God. Verse 2. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of the King Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chabar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. If you read chapter 8, you'll see why I put hand in all caps. Then after this, you have verses 4 through 25 describing God's throne that have cherubim and wheels attached to it, going to and fro, fro in all directions. Verse 26. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man upon it. And chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, explicitly state that the man upon the throne that spoke to Ezekiel was the Lord God. So, when John wrote, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, that you know that he was drawing upon Ezekiel 126, 1, 3, and 1, 1, and all the other Old Testaments to the embodied Yahweh coming to the prophets, that we should translate John 1, 1, C as, the Word was God. Reminder to hit the subscribe button below, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, and leave a comment. And don't forget to look in the description below for the link for the handout so that you will always be ready when they come knocking at the door. But in the meantime, stay salty.